All right. Um, good evening, everyone. I'm Ram from uh, Singapore. And uh, yeah, and Pranay, uh, as, as he rightly put it, you know, I've been asked to uh, talk on how you set up an ECMO service. Um, clearly, you know, it's a job more um, said than done because it's easy to sit down and say how you do it diligently. But when you really set it up as a service, um, you need to you need to um, consider a lot of factors. Um, so to take you through some of these important aspects, um, let me go through my slides. Yes, moving. Okay, one plus. Right. Okay. Um, clearly, you know. Um, the establishment of an ECMO service goes through many stages. Um, very often than not, when I talk to colleagues from different parts of the world, the usual style of uh, starting an ECMO service is right in the middle of something serious, say like a pandemic. Um, hospitals tend to acquire machines, one or two of them. And then they haphazardly try to set it up in a way that they can run it over a long time. Very often, they would find that their first three or four patients eventually die. And uh, then that program ends abruptly there. So that's that's a common story you, you get to listen to um, when, when you talk to people around the world. Um, but what I feel is, if you do this diligently, this service is there to stay. And all it needs is a set of planning, development, implementation, sustenance. It doesn't stop there. You need to look at how uh, you measure the quality of your program, you evaluate it, and you also need to have a vision on how you're going to do things in future. So getting more or diving more into the depths of how each of these aspects hold important, um, the ideal period to start um, or start thinking about organizing an ECMO program is about, say, uh, 12 months before your first, first patient goes on ECMO. I mean, though we talk about the ideal world, um, the real reality is something different. You might have to rush up with some of these aspects quite fast. But having said that, you know, um, if you go through this diligently, um, you would end up having a sustainable ECMO program that would run down for years. So people like Pranay and others who have established this in India and around the world, um, they have done it quite diligently over a period of time, giving importance to each of these aspects. So this includes commitment from the institution where you work. Um, you're uh, uh, having a proper leader for the program you need to select champions uh, for uh, heading each of the aspects of the ECMO program. Having a good training program like what Prana is conducting now um, with his ELSO endorsed program uh, is equally important. Uh, so is the development of the protocol. And as and when you develop the protocol, that's the time when you start looking at various ECMO machines in the market. And then you start about planning your first patient that needs to go on ECMO. Clearly, you know, um, it's it's... It's something that that it's it's a process in itself. Very often we tend to skip a few of these processes, and that's where you know uh, we find that the quality of the program suffers later. So let's let's let me start um, uh, with with the first aspect, uh, uh, in, in which which involves you know uh, the various resources that gets involved in the formation of an ECMO program. Of course, you need the key personnel. As I said earlier, you need a leader and you need for proper consultative services. Um, first and foremost, you need to make sure that your institution is committed to uh, support this program in the long run. Most of the institutions, uh, be it public or private, um, at the end of the day, they would look at any program um, to be uh, cost effective, at the same time, uh, something that brings profit to the hospital. So if you were to know more about the economics of ECMO, what, what, what is nothing but the economics of ECMO, 
the, the returns from an ECMO service will not happen in the first two to three years because that's the time when you're going to select your patients and this going to do ECMO on some of the uh, patients where outcomes would be really good um, rather than attempting it on somebody who is undergoing CPR. So clearly, you know, the returns might not be great in the first two to three years. But having said that, you know, a lot of the time uh, while you set it up, one of the important things that pops up for discussion is the cost of the program. Everybody labels ECMO as a costly program. Now, that is a relative term. Costly with regards to what? If you look at the, some of the other services your hospital might offer, you might find that that's costlier than an ECMO program. For example, in a properly uh, done organ transplant program or a cancer chemotherapy program might run into one and a half to two times the cost of a VA ECMO program. Or let's say you run a he maintenance hemo hemodialysis for a chronic renal failure program for at least a year, your returns from that such, such a program is not going to be as much as say, you know, you run ECMO on five or six patients. Um, having said that, uh, this has been looked into, into much greater detail in some of the bigger trials. The first or the, four, the, the, the best trial to um, uh, quote here would be the CESAR trial, which was done at the start of the century, where they looked at um, the return from... ECMO in terms of uh, how, uh, sorry Pranay, anything wrong? Okay, I'll continue. Um, so what I was trying to say was um, uh, from the CESAR trial perspective, uh, the cost was looked more um, at from, a, from an angle of quality adjusted life years, which was far better after ECMO. The same thing, you know, uh, with the pediatric trial, which involved the UK collaborative ECMO trial. So the return of investment will eventually happen. If, if, and if this is something you need to commit your institution to it, you'll have to talk them through all these economics. As a team, you know, you need to have a shared mental model. Um, it's going to be a team of mainly physicians, nurses, professionals, and allied staff. The most important thing about running an ECMO service is the fact that all these um, uh, team members would need to be on the same page as that of a, a, I mean, our same page when it comes to the management of the patient. So uh, they all should know how to attend to ECMO emergencies. It should not be like, this is not my job, it's your job kind of thing. So the team should be aware of, of, of the shared mental model of what stage of disease the patient is and how long it will take for the patient to recover. Clearly, you know, uh, it should focus on patient safety. And the culture of safety essentially comes from team training, process involvement, education, research, and of course, doing quality improvement programs such as mortality morbidity meetings. The key personnel, as I said earlier, in addition to the ones which I mentioned, you might have to involve respiratory therapists. Cardiothoracic surgeons are an inevitable part of this service. Um, and uh, so are the professionals and uh, um, other important uh, people like the um, transport people or the cannulation people, uh, all these all these people play a major role in your ECMO program. You then need to identify your customer. So you just have to be clear in your mind as to what kind of ECMO program you're going to run. A lot of them start off as just as a respiratory ECMO center. A few of them, they just have a well-developed cardiothoracic surgery program and hence they run their ECMO program as a pure VA ECMO program. A lot of them, again, you know, outside um, outside the realms of, uh, or outside Asia Pacific um, region, you would find that they run an exclusive eCPR program. So again, you know, um, or you may want to stick to a hub and spoke model where you choose a hub center where you can send some of your complicated cases to. So as a peripheral center, you still run it as a spoke center and you can run, uh, you can refer complicated patients to the hub center. 
the short and sweet of running a respiratory ECMO program is based on the understanding that you would be able to cater to a catchment area of about two to three million population. So if your city has already ECMO centers, you just need to figure out whether you would still be able to run a successful program because the number of ECMO centers in the city would already be catering to the population of the city. Um, now, this is done with the understanding that you would be able to do at least 12 to 15 cases a year because that's the minimum number you need to keep your skills up and going. The staffing design, essentially, you know, um, it's it's been historically manned by the professionals. But having said that, you know, the model is slowly shifting towards a team design where given the lack of available professional support, a lot of these um, uh, uh, duties are being shared by uh, nurses and by the bedside. And, and um, of course, you know, when you run an ECMO program, you need to have role clarity on who is going to do what. The ECMO director is usually the, the senior most person. He could be a cardiothoracic surgeon or a critical care specialist or a trauma surgeon or, or anybody, you know, uh, who's, who's trained in critical care or similar aspects. Um, the point uh, you need to know is that irrespective of who the ECMO director is or who the other people is, um, you need to be uh, sure that all members of the staff should be properly trained, including the director. The usual ratio of nurses to patients in a new center would be somewhere around one is to one. And as you go grow in experience, you would probably relax that to one is to two. The teams should be as, as, sorry, as self-sufficient as possible. Uh, meaning to say that, you know, if you have a troubleshooting to do, anybody in the team should be able to do it. And that's important because that's why we train you that way. Clearly, you know, everybody should be knowing about the overall decision making as part of daily rounds. So that should be an important thing to look at. And the non-intensive care support services that are required for an ECMO service to sustain include all this. The major bulk um, or the most important service I would deem as very important is the uh, blood bank service. It's very difficult to run an ECMO program without an established blood bank in your hospital. Clearly, you know, training of staff needs to be undertaken. This training should involve identifying core staff before the ECMO program starts, championing them, and those champions should then start training other people in their subspeciality on the practical aspects of ECMO support. It's not just enough that you train them, you should also evaluate their proficiency as to how good they are or whether they are fit enough to manage an ECMO patient by the bedside. Clearly, it's not enough that you train them alone. They should need to spend time in by the clinical bedside to achieve that eventual proficiency in uh, ECMO training. Clearly, and, and team members who are not proficient in ECMO should not be allowed to take care of ECMO patients. There should be role clarity, as I said earlier, who would, who would manage the ECMO, who would manage the ventilator, who would manage the patient, and who's the overall boss in this scenario as, in, as to, you know, um, who, would, who would take care of the patient management holistically rather than the parts and pieces of it. So clearly, you know, uh, this comes through a written up protocol and that protocol should involve uh, uh, chapter or a, or, or a passage on how to internally credential um, your team members. So some of the um, uh, important resources that are available for you to develop the protocol include the ELSO guidelines. Now, the ELSO guidelines are being updated for over the last three to four years. So the updated guidelines are all available free online on the ASAIO website. You may have a center-specific manual. You've got to understand that these guidelines, which are either released by the ELSO or by other institutions, they, they cater to that particular setting. And you might have a different requirement which for which you might have to tweak your protocol. So essentially, you know, your manual should have everything from how you select your patient to how you manage your emergencies and to how you come off ECMO or how you deal with a death on ECMO. Once you are done with all these things, you now choose your equipment. There are different equipments in the market. 
I mean, my duty is not to market one equipment over the other. But the point I'm trying to make here is it's at this point of time that you might want to choose what equipment you may want to use in your hospital. Clearly, there should be, if you, as your ECMO program expands, you will end up having a referral system, which means you will have to start thinking about how you plan your transport services. You should have a workflow for activation and you should have a point of contact in your hospital as to uh, uh, who would receive the referrals and decide on whether an ECMO should be initiated. As I said earlier, program evaluation is impo important. So you have to look at quality assurance review procedures. Major complications should be discussed in a morbidity meeting. It's good if you can uh, submit your data to international databases, such as the ELSO registry, because the ELSO registry then um, uh, stand, I mean, sends you your annual report and you can figure out how and where you stand in terms of your performance with relation to the global uh, performance. And then that might be one of the things um, you might want to achieve or you might want to set your goals to as, as part of improving your program. Again, newer centers are highly uh, advised to contact some of the bigger centers uh, or form an advisory committee of these bigger centers to help them blossom properly into a good center. So essentially, you know, you handhold uh, patients or, or the newer ECMO centers um, for a period of time, say six to eight months or a few cases, and then, you know, you let them do the do it on your own. And in such a concept, clearly, you know, we've, we've, we've figured out that a lot of bottlenecks get cleared and outcomes are better. So, as I said earlier, in addition to the ELSO guidelines, you have position papers that have been published for VV ECMO, VA ECMO. Clearly, you know, the process of uh, uh, setting up an ECMO program is that of an emotional roller coaster. For people who have set it up, they can clearly understand this uh, uh, diagram very nicely because when you start, you have a lot of optimism and excitement. Then you go through your thrill and euphoria when you get your first patient. You have your anxiety, the moments of anxiety when your patient is not doing well, and when your patient is carefully decannulated, you are feeling happy at that point of time, till you get the next complicated patient who eventually dies. Then you go through a, fear, a, a period of denial, fear, panic, despondency. Eventually, you know, you start understanding where the program needs to be tweaked, and then you start working on the process properly before you get to see the final results. And then you go into a stage of optimism again. So this is this is clearly there is a point of maximum risk and a point of maximum opportunity. It's essentially how you look at it as to whether the glass is half full or half empty. And and you know in this roller coaster you just have to figure out where you are currently. You will definitely go through this uh, different time points or different points at at various timelines. So that's all from my side. Thank you. I'm more than happy to take your questions.